Hi everyone, um, I'm Krithi Prasad and I'm a member of the class of 2023 at the University of Minnesota Medical School Twin Cities campus. Today we are talking with Sam Simmons, who is a licensed alcohol and drug counselor who has over 30 years of experience as a behavioral consultant specializing in practical, culturally sensitive, trauma-informed work with African-American males and their families. For over a decade, Sam has developed and managed a culturally specific trauma-informed project and curriculum that engages African-American males to promote healthy relationships and community. He's an adverse childhood experience interface trainer in the state of Minnesota, and is also the co-creator of the Community Empowerment Through Black Men Healing Conference that has been called Groundbreaking and Visionary. Um, Sam's work has been acknowledged nationally and locally as well. So today we are talking about trauma, historical trauma, and how trauma-informed care can transform the care that we provide to our communities. And this is as part of the Twin Cities Medical Society's Community Conversation Series. Welcome, Sam. Thank you for having me. All right, so my first question is, um, how would you describe trauma and historical trauma and a little bit about their impacts on health? Well, um... When I when I think about trauma, um, I, I I try to keep it simple. Something that in, uh, something that uh, happens too long, too 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 soon, um, you know uh, that uh, that too too long too soon for a person to uh, metabolize and and handle in their lives, right? So or too early. And and we see that, you know, like early childhood trauma, we have a trauma that happens suddenly and those kind of things. And the reason I like to think about trauma from that standpoint is that everybody's not affected by traumatic events the same, right? And, and you know, because in doing this trauma work, every now and then I would get somebody to say, well, you know, bad things happened to me and I turned out fine, you know, because people really... Um, um, have are really scared to talk about trauma, especially their own trauma, and they because a lot of people have been raised to believe that that's a weakness, right? And so we know that trauma affects people physically, uh, emotionally, psychologically in many ways, and have and can disrupt a person's life unless they address it. Uh, it can disrupt a person's uh, life over a long period of time. We know that trauma, um, <clears throat> early trauma, a lot, of, a lot of early trauma, childhood trauma uh, uh, is experienced in families and in, in homes and those kind of things. And, um, and, it, and, it, and sometimes I don't think we take it as seriously. Um, I think in the medical field, we take it a little bit more seriously because <clears throat> instead of, you know, really talking about what we would say the word trauma, because I, I always find that interesting, if you change the words, we can talk about it, is when we got into ACEs, right? And then they did the ACE study in uh, 89, I believe, um, Dr. Felitti and Dr. Anda, and basically the... Um, the study was really uh, because Dr. Felitti noted uh, some uh, behavioral changes in clients, and um, and started really investigating because um, uh, it was certain groups of clients, I think, and and looking in their background and started noting that there were certain type of traumas that showed up uh, or family experiences um in in their background and then him and dr Ander got together really did a, a, a uh, uh probably about seventeen thousand surveys uh to uh see if there was some consistency uh they narrowed that survey down to 10 questions which was a, a looking at you know family dysfunction looking at uh the different kind of physical and emotional and uh, psychological kind of traumas that happen to folks early before the ages of 18. And how does that affect medical outcomes later on in an in, in individual's health or how that their response to that trauma over their years can affect 
their health outcomes. And and so, you know, they narrowed it down to 10 questions. And like I said, some of them had to do with family dysfunction, like alcoholism, domestic violence, uh, somebody, you know, a family member going to jail, uh, separation and divorce. And so that ACES was revolutionary because it really <coughs> made, uh, in a way, folks taking seriously childhood trauma, right? Which was in for in my in my belief as being a man of color, um, I've always thought about childhood trauma. It's like, why do you have to have a study to realize if you mistreat children, you go, you've got a possibility to end up with screw up adults, right? It took, it took this survey. And I think, and, and, you know, in my belief, and I could be off, is the fact that it was, uh, you know, 75% white individuals, because, <clears throat> I don't know what's wrong with my throat today because it, uh, it was white individual, because every time we usually talk about trauma, it usually didn't include the population that was surveyed, middle class, uh, uh, education, and that kind of stuff. And, and again, that negative piece around addressing something that happens to people, right? Bad things happen to everybody, right? Uh, uh, little bad things happen to everybody. And when we say little bad, we talk about the little T's, right? And little T's sometimes, is more important to the individual than the big T sometimes because they're like really personal, right? And so I think the ACEs, even though I find it, you know, a little insulting that we had to have that to realize how about mistreating children was important for folks to take a, a, a look at how that affects the medical system. And I think that was the big piece is we can prevent a lot of medical issues in our system if we quit traumatizing our children, right? Um, it, because you get trauma, you get traumatized, then you're going to find a way to cope or adapt to the trauma. And that could be both negative or positive. And, and the negative is usually like, you know, we think about smoking, uh, eating, uh, uh, um, sexual behavior, all of that is a res can be a response to trying to deal with that, the effects of the trauma. So, um, and then, let me see, so, so they're connected. And so when we talk about historical trauma, uh, which is new, you know, which is shouldn't be, but it's really talking about the collective effect on a group of people, historical collective effect of a, of a group of people being traumatized as a group, right? And we got Dr. Uh, Braveheart, who really took a look at that in the Native American community. Uh, uh, we got uh, Joy DeGruy, who took a look at it. Uh, she called it post-traumatic slave syndrome in the Black community. Um, and though, and really taking, really taking the inner look of if we are truly human beings, when a lot of times we haven't been treated that way in the, the larger community, human beings hurt. Right. And, and if you deal with trauma, there's got to be some kind of uh, effect about that. And we shouldn't run away from that effect if we want to heal. Thank you. Um, a follow up question I have um, is in line with what you're talking about with historical trauma and is touches on your work kind of in the community <laughs> in Minneapolis. Um, how do you um, on an individual level, kind of help people understand and move through their trauma in practice. And that could be, you know, the individual kinds of ACEs um, that you mentioned or kind of historical trauma in these community-based traumas that, um, you know, people have experienced in their families for generations. The, well, in, in doing my work, uh, particularly uh, within, you know, within the community, um, just talking about it, because we don't talk about, we, we refuse to talk about trauma in our community because when you're a community, the African-American community, when you're in a community that's seen in the negative light on the news, in the media and that kind of thing, the last thing you want to deal with is something that uh, 
that appears to put you in a negative light, like talking about the trauma. And my thing is, is I, I frame it around stories, right? Um, and so I talked to them about ACEs. I remember when I first got trained in ACEs, they were real reluctant to talk about ACEs with clients because they didn't want the clients to feel bad, right? And I found that if you present it to them in a real down, a realistic kind of way and put stories that relate to them, they appreciate it because they internally know that there's something going on with them. But because they can't address it or because they only get um, when people respond to it is always in a punitive way or negative way, um, um, they think they're, you know, sometimes they, as they say, I feel crazy, right? And then, you know, when we talk about uh, ACEs and childhood trauma and and how abnormal that is, and and then you put you put the other layer of racial oppression on top of it. Unfortunately, in the black community, one of our coping styles is is believing that being black means you're supposed to suffer, and the more you can deal with suffering, the the best you can show your strength and resiliency, right? And so, so that's another way to block up that block out that conversation. But I've had clients who say, "Now, oh, okay, something happened to me, right? Uh, I'm not crazy." Now, the now the the response to their trauma. The problem is, is the response to their trauma it, it becomes negative, and then people will uh, uh, really respond to their response to the trauma. You know, uh, if there's domestic violence. But the, the other piece is, is we look at systematically our response to people of color black people in particular is always punitive and if you always respond to a behavior that other people do but in this particular group of people is always punitive what that does is make our larger society believe that there's something really specially wrong with those folks compared to other folks right it's like letting uh 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 little white kids go to juvie court and that's and a, a black kid does the same crime they got to go do it automatically adult court it's like ooh, ooh, they're 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 so flawed right and all they're doing is responding to the trauma that they have been experiencing and when we talk about the african-american community especially the african-american community who has slavery american slavery in their background we're talking about over 400 years of trauma that we haven't been able to slow down or respond to uh, thank you, Sam. Uh, you talked a little bit about this element of um, re-traumatization and, you know, how do these narratives get reinforced? Um, and, you know, I want to go into that a little bit more about how those narratives get reinforced within the healthcare system. Um, so, you know, trauma-informed care has uh, well been discussed outside of medicine, you know, in social work and mental health, um, even in the field of psychiatry, but it hasn't really made its way into kind of mainstream healthcare. Um, how do you envision um, trauma-informed care um, becoming kind of a mainstay throughout the medical system and what would that look like? Well, the thing is, is in parts of the medical system, they, they are familiar with the term trauma-informed care, um, um, you know, and, and, and I, and they've been, you know, I think they're familiar with the technical terms and technical aspects, you know, you know, being more aware of people's trauma and how that might affect them medically and all the other kind of stuff. Uh, the two biggest flaws in that whole thing, because again, it, it, the idea is understanding that everybody who comes in your space bring their own trauma and 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 then you should take that in consideration when you are dealing with them right um but what we don't do enough about is uh, yeah everybody in, you agreeing that everybody come in your space uh brings their own trauma but every space has its own trauma too right the people in that space uh, and those people bring their trauma to the staff. So we don't do enough about staff care and, 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 and staff's 
uh, viewpoints and biases. Like if you have a bias, uh, and, 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 you know, and we, you know, we've worked together over time and that kind of thing. And we've seen it. We literally could see where uh, a hospital setting uh, response, um, if you, if you're scared of black people, your response is going to be scared of black people. If you, especially when you deny it, right? It's going to affect how you, how you might uh, do an exam. It might affect on how, what kind of environment you want to see them in and all these other, all these kind of pieces. And, and that affects the, and then on top of that, what you do is reinforce with that group of people. Oh, okay. I guess there is something wrong with me. Right, because everybody who's responding to me respond to me in this kind of way, and we not being honest about those biases, right, that we bring to the party. I mean, think about it. You 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 bring to a, you know more of a community hospitals. We bring uh, doctors and staff from all over the state. You know, people come to community hospitals a, a lot of times have a lot of issues when they come in. And, and this is your first experience dealing with that other than what you see on TV, right? So staff bias, staff self-care are, are, I think, one of the biggest pieces and and why that's difficult, that means you got to get real. You just can't do no intellectual lecture on, you know, on hypotheticals. You got to, people got to get real, right? And, and be willing to give up something. You know, because when they're always talking about, well, equity. Well, equity, there is no equity unless people in power are willing to be uncomfortable. And part of privilege, you, there, there's a part of this, uh, you know, privilege that folks have, and some people won't call, talk about white privilege and those kind of things, is that I don't have to say anything or I can be silent. And, and I can be silent when my counterpart is, is mistreating this client, right? Because that's, you know, we're given that we can do that. We might feel bad later on, but we can do that, right? The other piece is so that brings us into the cultural awareness. Uh, you know, so things like what I found over the last what three, four, or five years in doing a little bit of work with some medical folks is really giving them a foundation about what historical trauma really is and how that might show up in their work how that might show up in because just sometime when we're talking about the medical field we got all these we got these structured classes and all these other kinds of things but sometimes you just need to sit in uncomfort to understand that you know i do great work but i still could probably improve if i learn how to have um uh now i got a better understanding that 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 client's response to me ain't about me. It's about their history and what has happened to them. And so being able to put the step in those client's shoes probably would go a lot further in terms of dealing with some of these things. Because again, we have some of the greatest school medical schools in the country, and we got some of the smartest young people in the country. But but none of that matters to me when you treat me like shit. So. Thanks, Sam. Um, as you know, we'll be sharing this conversation with uh, physicians and medical students across Minnesota. So my last question is, what can um, physicians, medical students, healthcare professionals do um, to support your work or um, kind of your overall mission um, around trauma-informed care and historical trauma healing? Um, I think, you know, trying to, you know, when we ask about, you know, supporting, you know, my work and that kind of stuff is um, really being willing to be uncomfortable and, 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 and actually extend outside their normal experience. If, you're, if your experience is you only deal with people of color on your job, that's not enough experience. I remember there was a, a teacher uh, who works at a, a, a special ed school out in the suburbs. And, um, you know, and there's kids of color in this school. And her seven-year-old daughter came home and, you know, and she feels like she's evolved and more aware. But her seven-year-old daughter comes home and tells her mama, I hate Black people. And she freaks out. 
because, you know, all of a sudden she wanted to ask me about what should she do. I said, what did you do? She freaked out on the child, scared the little girl, right, and that kind of stuff. And so I said, um, how often do you deal with people of color or black folks when you're not at, at the school? We, we don't. But what other responses the little girls would have? This, you know, she got this experience on the bus. The kid apparently was a bully in her, and it happened to be black. And we already live it. We already been proven that little children pick up some of this craziness as babies, you know, and that kind of stuff. What other experience is she going to do when you ain't showed her no other experience? And, and 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 we have a lot of those, especially here in Minnesota, but I think around the country, these bi these internal biases that we done did all these studies about, and all, like, why do we spend this money doing studies when we don't seem to it don't seem to improve nothing, which was been proven with with this uh, whole Corona uh, uh, COVID situation is that you talk about we've been talking about disparities, we've been spending money on disparities, on lectures and that kind of stuff, and then everybody still want to be surprised. You know, I mean, COVID is like, uh, if you didn't have your eyes open before, they better be open now. Now, the, the response is going to be, what are you going to do about it? Are you just going to go back into your own, when you get back, because everybody's trying to get back to comfortable, right? But what, what happens to the folks who have never been comfortable? And so if it, I would I would say if they want to help improve their awareness or uh, 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 do their own research around uh, historical trauma, expand their thought process, uh, deal with folks possibly like me or whatever, I don't, although there's only one like me, but um, um, it's really it put the work on you because it's always historically uh, uh, when I've I've been like the only black person in a lot of situations, but a lot of people don't know my background is actually chronic pain. I worked in chronic pain for 20 years, right? And 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 what had, what used to happen is I would always be responsible for their education, which is another uh, 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 trauma. Why wow, I got to be responsible for your education to deal with people like me and, and you know, well, what does that Sam? No, you go, you better go check this stuff out. No, you better go do this. No, you can't give all the client black clients to me. Even black clients w would get insulted by that, you know, because the black clients are saying, why did they give me you? Well, because you black. And I would tell them, yeah. And I said, you don't have to have me. Right. And, 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 and luckily, over the 20 years, the staff I worked with listened. And by the time the program closed, the pain clinic closed, which is a whole nother conversation by itself around chronic pain uh, and our opioid uh, uh, situation. But um, I would put them up against anybody. And I still was the only black person in, in the group because they were willing to be uncomfortable. Well, they had no other choice hanging with me, but be uncomfortable and, and, and be able to wear that uncomfort and even will be able to, you know, at times, when it, at appropriate times, let the client know they were uncomfortable and, and I need to let you help me, right? And, and the most important thing, and I want to probably end on this, you can ask me any question if you need to, is learn how to be uh, what I would call compassion and accountability. Compassion and accountability is really about we always do, you know, the, the always, you know, this kumbaya stuff, you know, oh, you know, I love my clients. I love my work. No, I don't, I don't love all my clients. Some of them I don't even like, right? But that doesn't mean that they don't deserve the, the, the best health, right? The best care. And so compassion accountability is about how do I be accountable and show compassion with people I might even despise, not, un, not understand, uh, feel uh, uncomfortable with, do, and how do I show them that compassion? And, and my thing is, if you're going to work with people, you got to believe that everybody who you come across deserves compassion, which might take work on your part. Some of the most, some of the clients I just like the most have done the best and made me a better person because I knew that they deserve compassion. Because accountability without compassion is never fair. And then compassion without accountability, where you just let them not have no accountability, don't do you or the client no good, and will get you into 
uh, being wishy-washy because you'll get mad at them because you did all these great things for them and they didn't say thank you. That was the most, well, you know, the client didn't say thank you. Okay, well, what's that all about, right? Because compassion and accountability brings clarity to change and also helps people be more successful in their therapy, more successful in their programming because they can feel that. And and I think that's one of the things that I would uh, I think is the most the biggest foundation of the work I do. Thanks, Sam. Um, as you know, I always love our conversations, and um, this element of compassionate accountability is something that um, I've thought a lot about um, with my future practice. Um, so thank you so much, and I think we'll end our conversation here. Well, thank you for having me. You know, it's always a, it's always a pleasure.